So here we are. We're gonna we're gonna get into it with Laura Sims. Um, first thing I'm wondering if you would do is fill in this sentence, kind of Mad Lib style. Um, I've been a coach since whatever year, and I specifically help who's your audience with what problem is that audience facing so that they can, where are they trying to get to? What solution are they trying to find? Sure. So I've been a coach since 2011. I specifically help people who want their work to make a difference, choose and start the right meaningful career so they can have a career that feels like home. Love that. I'm curious, do you remember how you arrived at that? Because I know that your ability to even articulate that that clearly, um, you and I like really got into coaching around the same time. I know I struggled for a long time to go like, how do I say what I do? Um, I'm just curious if you happen to remember what that process was like for you. For sure. So I started, I think, think the way a lot of new coaches started, which was just a very general, generic, come work with me and improve things. You know, I was not niched down very much. I was, uh, my original website did have language about working with creatives. I was kind of like, you got a career creative something path, like come, we will work on transformation. It was very general and generic. And eventually it kind of split off into two buckets, which was one, let me figure out the right career. And two was more business coaching for creatives. Let me help creatives with their marketing. And I really thought that's where I was going to go. I thought eh, this career change thing, you know, for those people, bless their little hearts, let me make a PDF or something. So when they come to my website, they can at least buy something and get some direction. But I'm really, my bread and butter is going to be this business coaching. So I started to write my little PDF and it got longer and longer and longer. And I realized, oh, I have a lot to say here. And it's not something that I'm seeing said anywhere else. I think I actually have more compassion for these people over in this column. What if I made my business the career transition piece? And so that really kicked things over. And I know because I registered a trademark. My first use of the phrase your career homecoming was in 2012. So it was about a year into my business of kind of landing on this is the problem that I'm going to help people solve. This is the language that it's going to be wrapped in because it feels like it really describes the experience of wanting that, that sense of home, not just go get any job, not just climb a ladder, but something that really feels like me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like a year is exceptional. I, I just, you know, if I just think of like some of our mutual colleagues who have gone through like three or four or five different rebrands and different like kind of like refining that focus. And I only point that out um, to try to normalize it. Yeah. Because and it's hard. So, right. So to be clear, I continue to do other work during that time. I didn't just cut off all other offers and only do your career homecoming. I did do that at some point. I think I maybe did that four or five years in, mm -hmm. but for the first, I'd say a good four or five years, I had other offers. I would do a seasonal thing here. I would partner with someone else over here. Um, so I didn't get that niched in till years into the process. It, it's occurring to me just now that that actually is something of an indication of your gift and your hard work with your clients. Because my guess is that in the same way that someone might go through three or four different iterations of branding before they're finally like, oh, this is the brand, the, the niche, the topic, the problem I want to help people with, the solution I want to bring them to. It's probably a lot like that with career too. I mean, like, would you tell me a little bit about like who is coming to you? Like when they are first on that call with you, what are some of the most common things that they're saying that they're going, this is shit and I'm struggling, <laughs> I hate it. So my, my clients are coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. So it's not just, you know, I get engineers or I get artists or teachers. People are coming from all different industries because they've gotten into those industries all kinds of sideways <laughs> by sideways means right so but what they have in common there's really two i say two main categories of things that they talk about all right one is just strategy 
I don't know what my gifts are. I don't know what my skills are. I don't know how to apply my skills to something new. It's the how do I figure it out piece? What is going to give me meaning and money and purpose? And P.S. Can I please have a life outside of work? I just don't know where I, they don't know how to figure it out. So that's a, that's a big topic of conversation. And then it's not long until the conversation starts to get into and I don't know it, where's it, what's the chicken in the egg, but there's this other category that's almost about loss of self. Mm. I feel like I don't know who I am anymore. I don't feel like myself anymore. I feel like I'm not vibrant. I've lost my spark. I don't want to talk about myself with people anymore because I don't want to have to fake that I'm happier than who I am. It's this erosion of self part that is feeding into or a product of this this um kind of detachment from knowing your place in career. That is tough, especially uh, the, I don't want to talk to people about like what I do because I feel like a lot of people, you know, corporate is kind of the main vehicle for like the majority of the jobs that are out there, unless you tell me differently. Cause I definitely, <laughs> you're, you're seeing a lot more than me. And it's like to be in corporate is to essentially be an actor on some level, you know, and that's why there's so many funny corporate memes of people who are like, you know, per my last email. And then like, what I'm really thinking is, hello, did you even read my last, you know, all that stuff. Um, and it's like to then get to a point where you feel so out of touch with yourself that you, say you meet a new friend at a coffee shop and you feel reluctant to talk about yourself. That is like an incredibly stuck space to be. Well, I, people will say things like, I don't want to talk to my friends about like if the topic comes up and we're out to dinner, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't want to date mm. because I know it's going to come up. I don't even feel like I'm the kind of person in a place that I would want to be to date somebody right now because I'm stuck around this or I have shame around this. Um, I don't feel like I'm prepared to be a parent because if I don't, mm. pardon my language, have my shit together, how am I going to parent this little human and have this like, adorable disruption thrown into my life when I feel like I'm not steady. So it really can become this big log jam in people's lives and they stop putting off goals. They stop engaging in important relationships because they don't have this piece of themselves figured out yet. And you're speaking to something that for coaches who don't want to niche down, I really want to point out and highlight, which is that Sometimes the reluctance for a coach to pick a certain pathway to say career coaching or business coaching or whatever is they're like, well, but I don't want to not be able to do this rich personal transformation work that I feel like if I just talk about career, to use the example of what you do, I wouldn't be able to do that. But everything you're describing here is all about rich personal transformational work. And it just happens to be going through the lens of career coaching. That's absolutely right. The, at least the work I'm doing, I can't speak for all the career coaches, but like this is transformational work. We are on the topic of career. The outcome that we're going to get someone is they know the right career. But what this work is really about, it's about belonging. Mm -hmm. It's about identity. It's about contribution. It's about place in the world. It's about relationship to others. Um, these are deep conversations that we're having and these make deep changes in people's lives. Yeah. We have a, a, a week, it's reminding me of a, a, a week that we spend in CLCC on relationships. And we start with what's your relationship to yourself. And we ask questions like, what's your relationship to your body? And how does that show up in like other areas of your life? Or what's your relationship to your career? And how does that show up in other areas of your life? And I just, I just love how there's so much of what you're describing that has made room, that career that feels like home. Um, it's made room for the, the kind of strategic end of things, or maybe what the ICF would call the what, as well as the way of being, which is the who, and bringing those two together. And certainly somebody can be the kind of career coach that is solely about like, I'm going to help you get all the right bullets on your resume. You can do that. But as I understand your work, that's that's not the area you like to hang out. That's not where I want to be. But thank goodness for the resume people because <laughs> that's needed. And so I think, you know, as um, 
when you're a coach, part of your your duty is to help your potential client understand the the goals you're going to work towards um, and what is in bounds and what is out of bounds. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if I had a separate offer, so this offer is just about let's discover and start the right thing. I'm not doing resumes. I'm not doing interview prep. Let's say I had another offer that client, this would be smart for me to do, that clients could come do for me after they've done your career homecoming. They could come do like your homecoming resume and we could work on that. You know, I could say we're not going to be you know, if this kicks up unworthiness for you, this is not the place we're going to be talking about this. This is where we are going to find the correct verb and put the right numbers in your resume. And that's fine if that's what's communicated to the client up front, right? So I think there is an importance about expectation setting in terms of the results, but also how we're going to work together and what's on the table and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have like a specific process that you walk each of your clients through or is it more free form? It is very structured and mm. it's structured because kind of the, I think of it in terms of the promise that I'm making to the client mm -hmm. okay. promise that I'm making to my clients. There's just one offer. There's one way to work with me. Okay. And the promise is we're going to figure out what your homecoming career is. So we know the thing we're going to figure out the plan there. So, you know, the path and you're going to have the confidence to go do it. Mm -hmm. Because I have a very results driven offer, we got a really <laughs> structured way to get there so that we make sure that they're doing that. So every client is going to be different and we can tailor it to their specific needs and challenges and circumstances. But everybody's got to do the exercises in week one. Everybody's got to figure out the stuff in week two to make sure that we're hitting those outcomes at the end. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things of like, how do we leave the room? And I, I feel like with your work, I'm sure you there is the room for like the the expansion contraction of really all the feelings that are going to come up throughout that process. Like that's where some of the like loose places go. But, you know, to make I, I think that what you describe is a form of really client care to make sure that it doesn't wander into navel gazing territory, navel gazing. Um, we've all done it. We've all spent our time kind of going, what is, what is my, you know, you, and it's like kind of going, wait, hold on. I actually, if I want to get out of this career that is not lighting me up, I got to do something about it. There's, there's actual, actual structural things that I have to investigate if I'm going to make sure I don't just repeat a cycle and jump from one career that isn't great to another one that isn't working for me either. Absolutely. And a lot of my clients have done a lot of navel gazing, a lot of personal development work um, before they've gotten to me. And what's nice about that is they do have this basis of self-knowledge, but they've also figured out that learning more about yourself is not enough to answer this question. Mm -hmm. So um, I think just having that distinction between what is the difference between personal development and life coaching and career change strategy they can support each other, but they're not the same. How do you like to talk about that or differentiate them? Personal development is going to be more about know thyself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've done some um, particular system of I'm a Enneagram this, or I'm a life design this, or I'm a star chart this, any kind of system like that, or even just free writing and journaling. You know, you kind of get to know your values, your priorities. That all helps. What's missing in a career choice context is how do I apply that knowledge into making an actionable choice, mm. right? I mean, you can tell me I'm a firstborn Capricorn, you know, whatever, <laughs> and I don't know what career that is. Your values are integrity, um, communication, and creativity. I don't know what career that is. Yeah. I mean, that can, you know, that can just be like a plug and play anywhere. Exactly. So what's really different over here is we're, we've got a process to apply relevant self-knowledge into making an actionable choice so people can do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. So this question might not go anywhere and we can abandon it if so, but I'm actually curious in this moment about the money piece because it's occurring to me that I could see a lot of people going, what I know about myself is that I'm highly creative. And so what I wish I could do all day is write a novel or paint, but I have this practical reality of how to put a mortgage together or 
you know, make sure that I can feed my kid or, you know, whatever the different obligations and responsibilities are. And I'm curious about how you navigate those kinds of conversations where what someone longs to do isn't necessarily partnered with, um, I don't want to say fast and easy money, um, because I don't think that's what it is, but like there's a long game to becoming a full-time, you know, landscape oil paint, oil painter. Yeah. So this put, uh, potential tension between here's what my heart wants to do and here's what my bank account needs is really accounted for in the curriculum, right? So knowing that this is going to be a thing for people, this is woven into our process a bit. We're specifically not doing follow your passion, mm -hmm. which is like, I love to write. I'm going to be a writer. And just if I love it, the money will come or, you know, what? Good luck. I, it sometimes it does. And if follow your passion works for people, I encourage them to keep following their passion. But for my clients, they're like, this isn't working. Um, we're really looking for the career that gives them meaning, uh, makes a contribution that they, you know, uh, can connect with, uses their skills and strengths, and supports their life. Yeah. Now, I'm never going to tell someone what choice to make. I'm going to show them what choices are available. So let's say I've got someone who is a novelist at heart. After we explore the options, they might decide, I'm going to be a novelist. That's my homecoming career. But I have to acknowledge that I'm going to need to pay the rent in the meantime. So I'm going to have a companion career that's as a, I don't know, customer service representative or something. So I'm, I'm in my mind, novelist is coming first, but I'm going to have this other source of income. Totally valid. I might have someone else who says, you know what, um, I don't need a novelist to be, you know, my identity out in the world. That's just something that I want to do for myself, but I still want to do meaningful work. So I'm going to find some other way to be a writer or use some other skill set that I have. So you're going to know me out in the world as, you know, Jane, the customer success specialist, but I know back here I'm writing a novel and that's the way what that I'm, I'm really up to, you know, so like people are going to prioritize wherever it needs to go. And then sometimes it's not, people end up not choosing between novelist and, you know, corporate customer success. Sometimes there's this other third thing that's neither of those, but that's using their skills. It's letting them contribute. They feel invigorated by it. And we didn't even have that on the menu of options before we started working together. And this is the third thing that just really feels like it checks so many of these boxes. I can still write a novel, <laughs> but I don't have to count on that being my source of income. So um, short story is, if it's not going to support your financial needs, it's not your homecoming career. And we can mourn that. Or if it is, you better go find another source of income so that you're not reliant on that thing. Yeah, I feel on. like with creative, work it's really about how do we get to the place where art informs life and life informs art yeah. and i i always think of um aaron sorkin who in his earliest days when uh worked as a bartender and would write out his stories on uh bar napkins and uh, i mean speaking of like something that if you're a writer is going to inform your art i mean like sitting at a bar someone has a couple drinks they start telling you their stories they all have different voices and intonations and they're all characters on in a sense and then he would take those napkins home at the end of his shift and he and his roommates uh he had three or four roommates i think shared one computer this is back in the olden days where you didn't have you know a phone as your computer in your pocket all the time you had a desktop computer and that was it and you know would take turns using the computer for whatever they needed to work on like some of them were in school and stuff like that and then he would type up what he had written on his bar napkins um and so i just i think that there's a certain level of of with that story of you know, if your art is something that you are allowing into your life and it's truly like part of who you are and who you want to be in the world, it's going to find its way, even if that has to be scribbled on a bar napkin in between getting people a beer or whatever he was fetching for them. Yeah. And I also really want to, I think the internet can also pressure people into feeling like if they don't 
follow their passion, if they don't do the romantic thing of writing notes on bar napkins and um, that somehow their choice is less than or somehow mm -hmm. not as valid. And that's just not it at all. We're really looking, we're going to use this structure that I've got set up in the program, but the structure is designed to facilitate their choice. What is their priority? And especially in this season of their life, really figuring out for them what matters most mm -hmm. and, and taking out all the other voices and all the other influences. And my family always said, and here's what my peer group does, getting back to that sense of home. Here's what I know to be true for me. And let me develop the courage to go do whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all those different pressures. I mean, again, we're going back to, it's just a lens or an entry point for that personal work. And that's, you know, cause it's like, I mean, people show up just for coaching outside of career with, I can't let go of what my family thinks yeah. about me, you know? Yep. So I, I'm curious, this is, I think one of my last questions, I I've come up with many more just from, from getting to jam with you today. I'm curious about what's something that you know now about working for yourself or running a business that you wish you had understood earlier? I spent a long time comparing my pace and my timing to mm -hmm. other And I would see people, you know, six figures in this many months and margarita on the beach with my laptop, like, you know, all those kind of headlines. Um, and I really wish I had spent less time comparing how fast people got places. Um, I am slower mm. than ever going to be enticing for a headline. Um, I now 13 years in, I really value and prize my slow and steady approach. I like to say that I have a cheetah heart, but turtle legs. So I have big ambition, but I'm not going to break myself to get there. I'm going to move more methodically. Um, I tend to be a systems builder. I tend to do one thing at a time and really build off of that. Um, and I think now I see that as a real asset. Yeah. You know, I don't have any big stories about whoosh, this huge, uh, massive stage of growth, but I also don't have any story about a big crash where mm -hmm. things chaotic and out of control and I couldn't manage it anymore. Um, you know, there, but by the grace of God, go I. Um, so I think just the the comparison piece of the timing and the pace, and I just really, at this stage, trust my timing. Yeah. I think there's so much that um, we can look at that's happening for other people, and we think, oh my gosh, this means they've made it. Or, you know, like I think of media coverage. You know, I remember the first time that somebody ever from a publication was like, can I cite you as a source? And I'm like, oh my God, like, this is it. This is it. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking this is it. And like, no, I did not get like 50 new clients from that media placement. I did not, you know what I mean? Like it, 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 it looked, it probably looked that way to people. And, and I'm always grateful to be included, right. You know, all that, but it just, it doesn't happen that way. That and the longer that I've been doing this, the more I have learned about some of the, um, not certainly not everyone, but some of the business models that were sustaining that flashiness. And like some of those business models were investing, say, twenty to $40,000 in Facebook ads to have a big launch, which now, of course, Facebook ads do not perform anywhere near what they did. But you know, at least, you know, it's about knowing what works for you. I know for me, my business has never been in debt. And I personally would not be able to sleep at night spending 20 or 30 or $40,000 on Facebook ads in the hopes of getting a six figure launch. Like I, I just, I'm not wired that way. Some people are and, and it pays off for them. I'm not wired that way. And I think that comes back to just kind of knowing yourself and trusting that it's your central nervous system that's at stake in all of this. So you got to, you got to, and it's not that there's one right and one wrong, but you've got to adjust to what you can tolerate. So I'll be over here going slow, but I'll be getting somewhere.
Well, and I think this is a great place to like let this this conversation land is the fact that you're still doing it. That's the thing. Like you've made your career workable. You you know, you're in all of those domains of what your career homecoming is. You're you're basically walking the talk. And so, yeah, if somebody wants to go the big flashy route and and they can do that, it's like all about it. I admire those people too. Um, but if it's not, it's really helpful for anyone listening to this to know that they don't have to go that way. Yeah. So, well, thank you for being with us. Is there anything that you would like to leave us with that is timely or current that you um, you want to direct people to? Um, I, of course, am going to be linking everything up and all that good stuff, but anything you want to leave us with? I mean, of course, you know, come check out yourcareerhomecoming.com. It's one of the nicest things I own. So come say hello. Um, but, you know, just an encouragement to to new coaches that, um, you know, you've got you've got the calling on your heart. Um, and you're going to hit rough patches. You know, you're signing up for challenge. That's what part of this is. Um, so don't be afraid to just like keep turtling through <laughs> and, and finding your way and showing up with clients. Um, it's, this is a long game. Yeah. Yeah. And a long game is a hundred percent worth it. Yeah. Like I don't imagine you or the people you help would want to rewind <laughs> and go to what came before the long game. The yeah. long game is what builds a life. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you.